let's let's get started. Is 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 there a holiday or something? There are mu much fewer people today, huh? It's what? Oh, the sun. It was it was out there yesterday also, no? <laughs> it's Friday. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Well, too bad. I'm going to cover a lot of exciting topics today, which make good exam questions, also, by the way. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let's, let's get started. Uh, we've been talking about a lot uh, about single cycle and multi cycle architectures, and today we're going to see uh, another example multi cycle architecture, microprogram machines, as I promised yesterday. Uh, and how hopefully you're doing your readings, but bef uh, and this is just to re refresh your memory. We're going to do a little bit of performance analysis to motivate uh, multi uh, microprogram architectures, or at least analyze the designs that we've done. Uh, yesterday and the previous days. And uh, so you'll remember the iron law of performance, number of instructions times average CPI times clock cycle time. Okay, we'll get back to that. And you hopefully recall the microarchitecture design principles that we discussed, critical path design, common case design, or MDAL's law, and balanced design. And we said that a multi-cycle machine uh, satisfies these principles, whereas a single cycle machine is not very good. And this is our multi-cycle microarchitecture. Basically, we use multiple cycles to process an instruction. And these were the principles that we've discussed. You divide the instruction processing into states. Uh, uh, and a stage in the instruction processing cycle can take multiple states. And you sequence from state to state to process pieces of an instruction. Right? And the behavior of the machine is completely determined by the control signals that are asserted within each state. And the behavior of the entire processor is fully specified by a state machine. And we already discussed this. In a state, control signals control two things, the data path elements and how to generate the control signals for the next cycle. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And this was a state machine that we implemented with the multi-cycle microarchitecture in the last lecture. OK, let's do some performance analysis very quickly. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. You can read it in your book. But this is the single cycle machine that we had designed. Actually, it's in your book. It's very similar to the single cycle machine that we had designed. Uh, basically, uh, as you remember, every instruction takes a single cycle here. So CPI is always one. Clock cycle time is determined by the longest critical path latency. And in this case, if you read your book, you will also see that it really uh, is how long it takes to read the program counter register and then how long it takes to access the instruction memory. And there is a parallel path here. The maximum of the register file read sign extension and this muxing, uh, well, sign extension plus the muxing over here, uh, and the ALU latency, and uh, the memory latency again, and the mux latency over here again, and then the setup latency of the register file. So that's the maximum critical path, and that happens for a load instruction. I don't know if it's written over here, but it's not written. We will see that in the next one of those next slides. It happens for a load instruction. So load instruction really is the longest latency instruction, assuming fixed latencies for all of these structures over here. Basically, that's our critical path uh, uh, latency. So if you assume some parameters in this design also, your critical path latency is 925 picoseconds. You will see that in your book also. And how do you calculate performance for a single, uh, single uh, application? For example, if you are running 100 billion instructions, uh, if you execute this on the single cycle machine that you've designed, the execution time is very simple. 100 billion times one cycle per instruction times the cycle time. And we've just computed that to be 925 picoseconds, right? So the program takes about 92.5 seconds, if our calculations are correct. Now let's take a look at the multi-cycle performance. In multi-cycle machines, now you have two things, cycles per instruction and clock cycle time. You need to compute both. And instructions take different number of cycles in the machine that you've designed in the previous lecture. For example, branches and jumps take three cycles. R type instructions, store words, add instructions, add immediates uh, take four cycles, and load word takes five cycles. If you look at the state machine, you will see that there are five states that you need to go through to execute a load word. Okay, so how do you compute the CPI? Well, to be able to compute the CPI cycles per instruction, you need to somehow have a mix of the instructions of the program. Right? Um, in this case, let's assume this mix. Uh, so there are benchmarks that are used to evaluate microprocessor design. Spec is one of them. This is actually a relatively old one. Uh, 
their integer floating point. There are many, many benchmarks that you can come up with. So you'll need to evaluate it on a workload or on a program that you care about. Let's assume that the program that we care about has 25% loads, 10% stores, 11% branches, 2% jumps, 52% R-type instructions like, across all of the instructions that are executed. How do you compute CPI? Now it's very simple, right? It's basically uh, you take how long, uh, what, what is the fraction of the instructions and how long it takes to execute that instruction. So for loads, this is the term that uh, computes the cycles per instruction for the load. Uh, loads are 25% of the instructions, and each of them takes five cycles per instruction. So they contribute this much. You do it for every single instruction over here, basically uh, R-type so, uh, store word and add I takes four cycles, and these are the R-types, and these are the store word over here. We, don't, we didn't specify add I's over here. As a result, this is the term you get, and this is the term you get for the branches and jumps. Make sense? So this fraction of the instruction takes three cycles, this fraction takes four cycles, this fraction takes five cycles. So on average, what you get is 4.12 cycles. It's closer to the load latency because there are a lot of loads in our type instructions, as you can see over here. So our average CPI is not one anymore, it's 4.12. Okay, that's part of the performance equation. So always keep in mind is this realistic five cycle load. We will change this later uh, when we discuss because loads are not always uh, a specified amount of latency because memory may not always take uh, one cycle, right? Uh, we're assuming that memory is taking one cycle here. That's a very unrealistic assumption in today's machines. Uh, that was true. Our assumption, we, we made the same assumption as a single cycle uh, machine also, but keep this in mind. So we've computed the CPI. That's good. This is how you do the cycles per instruction computation for a program, uh, for a given program with these characteristics, with this distribution of instructions. Now we also need to compute the cycle time. So multi-cycle critical path hopefully will be lower. Right? And if you do the computation of the critical path, which I'm not going to go into detail about, but the critical path goes through the load, uh, again, it goes through a maximum of the ALU, MUX, and memory. And uh, the register read delay and MUXing delay and the register setup delay. So you don't, you don't start from the beginning of the pipeline because you, you really start from uh, essentially over here, right? Your critical path is really in this stage. I hope you're seeing this. Yes, that's good. So your critical path is really in this stage. It's not the entire pipeline because we've broken into stages. Uh, it's, it's not the entire uh, machine because we've broken into, it into multiple cycles as you've seen. Okay, so that's our critical path. So if you do the calculations again, if you plug in the numbers, you will get 325 picoseconds, which is much better than 925, right? That sounds good. So we've increased the clock frequency by ensuring that each instruction takes multiple cycles and the cycle time is smaller. You could actually uh, you could incre increase the clock frequency even more by doing better, uh, by, by reducing uh, each, of the uh, each of these uh, steps, if you will, each of, uh, what you do in each clock cycle. But for this design, we got 325 picoseconds. Now the question is, is this good enough? How do you know? You need to do the calculation with the performance analysis, right? So let's do the same thing for, well, uh, for the same 100 billion instruction program. Our CPI we compute is 4.12. Our clock cycle time is 325 picoseconds. Now if we want to c compute the execution time, it's the number of instructions, 100 billion, times CPI, times the clock cycle time. Then we get 133 plus nine seconds, which is worse than the single cycle machine. Right, that was 92.5 seconds. So, so what, what's wrong about this? Or is there something wrong about this? We tried to improve performance, clearly, by reducing clock cycle time, but we actually reduced performance, actually significantly, from 92 to 134. Why did this happen? <laughs> clearly, our CPI went up, cycles per instruction went up. That's one of the reasons, right? But why did it go up? Why did it go up so significantly? It wasn't able to, the clock cycle increase, clock cycle time increase wasn't able to outweigh the downside of doing things in multiple cycles. So there are many uh, potential answers over here. One question is, did we actually break the stages in, in a balanced manner? Is the, the other way of thinking about this question is, is a critical path of 325, is, the, is it the best thing we can do? Can we do better? So if you actually 
do the calculation. If your critical path was 200, we would be higher performance, I think. I don't do that calculation. Yeah, basically, we would get uh, 82.4 seconds in that case, right? So we just needed a better clock cycle time. Maybe we didn't do a good job uh, in reducing our critical path. So if you want your performance to improve, you should not just reduce uh, your uh, critical path, but you should reduce it enough over here because there is another part of the equation, which is cycles per instruction that goes up. That's the idea. And also, as we've discussed last time, there's the overhead of setup and hold times, right? Those are not uh, zero. So let me go back to the previous slide over here. I'll do this. If you look over here, this is the setup and hold times. It takes about 50 picoseconds over here. There's also the register file setup over here. So if you look at this equation, we're actually wasting 50 picoseconds for just writing and reading from the registers. 50 out of 325 is not little. Okay, and maybe, maybe this workload is not very good, right? For, this, for executing on this uh, machine with this characteristics, with these characteristics. Maybe if you had different assumptions about the workload instruction mix, then you would get a different number. And that's always true, actually. Your CPI would be different, cycles for instruction would be different. Remember, we had 52%, uh, I think 52%, I'll go back again, sorry. Yeah, 52% R-type instructions. R-type instructions took four cycles to execute. What if that was very little? And we had instructions that, uh, that take three cycles. Most of the instructions would take three cycles. Then we would get a very different CPI, so our performance would be very different. So all of these affect uh, the execution time you get at the end. But the reason I'm going through this is uh, you don't always improve performance by doing something that would likely improve performance. You've got to analyze the performance. You've got to figure out whether it has improved or has not improved on what workload and try to really improve performance methodically by reducing the execution time. That's what you need to do. Of course, uh, there's also realism issues, right? The multi-cycle machine is much more realistic, if you will, compared to a single cycle machine. If your memory takes much longer, all of these assumptions will differ, and you will see that multi-cycle machine becomes much more realistic. So it's not just about performance. Going from single cycle to multi-cycle is not just about performance, but it's also about realism and all of the design principles that we've talked about. Okay, did this surprise you? This performance analysis, maybe? But this is a perfect example, a concrete example of how clock cycle time and CPI go against each other. You reduce the clock cycle time, your cycles per instruction easily goes up. Now, if you reduce it to 200 seconds, actually, we, our, our cycles per instruction would go up again. So my calculation over there was not really correct. You wouldn't get 82.4 uh, seconds, I believe, unless, uh, unless you're dividing your things really, really well. You would likely have additional cycles to execute some instructions. So this 4.12 would actually increase. So you would get 200 over here and maybe five over here. And if you get up to five over here, then you are back to losing performance, right? This will be 100 seconds, which is higher than 92.5 seconds. Make sense? So you gotta be careful, basically. Okay, so that's, I think, most of what I would like to say about the performance analysis. This is just a review. This was our single cycle MIPS processor. This was our multi-cycle MIPS processor. And this was our multi-cycle MIPS finite state machine, if you remember. Uh, you can always ask the question, what is the shortcoming of this design, right? Uh, and I've already asked this question earlier, but I think the more specific question is, what does this design assume about memory? So this design assumes that memory is one cycle, right? If you look over here. So it doesn't really talk about, it doesn't take into account the fact that memory may take longer. Sometimes five cycles, sometimes eight cycles, dot, dot, dot. So what do you need to do? How do you take into account memory? What if memory takes more than one cycle? Well, the idea is very simple. We have a finite state machine. If you look over here, uh, in the fetch stage, we're reading memory. Uh, here, we're also reading memory. Here, we're writing memory. All you need to do is wait in that state until memory tells you, okay, I gave you the data back. That's the idea. If the memory takes not one cycle, uh, let's go over here, actually. If the memory takes not one cycle, but let's say some arbitrary amount, uh, numbers of cycles, uh, you wait in the state until the memory tells you it's ready. So basically, you have another 
uh, arrow over here, starting from this state, going back to this state, you stay in the state if the memory is not read. That's the idea. And you put that loop in all of the states where you're waiting for memory. You stay in that state until the memory becomes ready. So you have another control signal coming back from memory telling you, Mem uh, I'm ready. Now you can proceed. You have the data. So if you have a memory that takes 100 milliseconds, your cycle time can still remain as 325 picoseconds. You just wait many, many cycles in that state. In the same state, you're just waiting for memory. Your control signals are asserted such that memory is enabled and you're waiting for it. Make sense? So that's very simple. Now you can accommodate memory that's arbitrary cycles. Actually, anything that's arbitrary cycles, right? For example, if your ALU doesn't take one cycle, all you need to do is add a control signal coming from ALU saying that I'm ready at this time. And you wait in the state until that signal is asserted. If that signal is not asserted, you keep doing the same thing in the state. Control signals don't change. So I can now uh, incorporate arbitrary cycle execution units as well, in addition to memory. So that's the power of this multi-cycle finite state machine-based uh, architectures. And we will see this in the, in the LC3B architecture that we're going to discuss today. Sounds beautiful, right? OK, great. So you couldn't do something like this in single cycle machine, for example. OK, I, I already said this, basically. We already discussed memory ready bits as an input to the control logic that determines the next state. OK, today we're going to talk uh, a little bit more, go, go a little bit more into detail about a microprogrammed uh, microarchitecture. That's one way of designing a multi-cycle machine. It's not the only way but it's one way. And we're going to look at uh, an elegant example of it, uh, which is the LC3B microarchitecture, which is really discussed in appendix, uh, the, the, uh, the additional appendices that we put up uh, online, appendix A and C, which I've been telling you to read. And as I said yesterday, this was developed by Morris Wilkes, uh, and he said it was the best way of designing an automatic calculated machine. You could argue with that after we discuss other uh, machines, perhaps. But it's an, uh, there's no question that it's an elegant implementation of a multi-cycle microarchitecture. Uh, so, okay, what is a multi-cycle? I've already uh, gone through this slide. I'll go through this very quickly again. Basically, in a multi-cycle microarchitecture, we divide instruction processing into states, and we sequence from state to state to process an instruction. And we specify the behavior of the entire machine using a finite state machine. And we generate control signals that control the data path and decide what the control signals will be in the next cycle. So let me give you some terminology. This is directly from the appendix C that you have. Basically, in microcoded machines, control signals that are associated with a state are called a microinstruction. And this is really powerful now because in a, uh, in, a, in a given state, all of the control signals, the state of the control signals, really tell you what you're doing in that state. It's not your instruction, but it's really your microinstruction. These are your control signals. And an instruction, now you can think of instruction being broken into many, many micro-instructions over its execution time, right? In this cycle, there's one micro-instruction. In the next cycle, there's another micro-instruction. In the next cycle, there's another micro-instruction, which is very powerful. Now you can maybe program the micro-instructions, as we will see. OK, so the act of transitioning from one state to another, i.e. determining the next state and the micro-instruction for the next state, is called micro-sequencing. So you're not sequencing, you're micro-sequencing. So if you, if you look at a program, you're really sequencing between instructions, right? Now, underneath in the hardware, we're sequencing between micro-instructions. So it's very similar to programming, actually. That's why we're going to be able to program these machines in the hardware level. OK, I'll define another thing. Control store, I actually uh, alluded to it last time uh, in the lecture. Control store stores control signals for every possible state that you can be in. These basically store the micro-instructions for the entire finite state machine. Remember, control signals for a given state, the same thing as micro-instruction. And control store stores those micro-instructions. If you have a 1,000 states, you have a 1,000 entry control store. This is, the, this is a memory that stores all of the possible micro-instructions, i.e. all of the states you can possibly in, be in. And there's also a micro-sequencer, which essentially does the micro-sequencing. The job of the microsequencer is to determine which set of control signals will be used in the next clock cycle. In other words, what should be your next state? In other words, what location should you be accessing in the control store to get the control signals for the next cycle? 
That's the idea. So that's terminology. Let's look at it uh, pictorially also. So this is our example control structure. It's beautiful. Uh, I've already discussed this, uh, each of the terms, but let's start with this one, micro-instruction. This is essentially all of the control signals that you need to use in the current cycle. And we're going to talk about some of these signals, but 26 of these in the LC3B microarchitecture, in these appendices, uh, that you should definitely read uh, to understand all the concepts fully. This appendix C. There's also appendix A, which is the LC3B ISA, which is very similar to LC3 with uh, some, some different additions and subtractions also. But this micro-instruction specifies the control signals that you need to do processing in the data path, plus to generate the control signals for the next cycle. Okay, so this micro, so 26 of them go to the data path, and they control the data path. Nine of them over here go back into the microsequencer. So microsequencer's job is to figure out what is the address of the next micro-instruction to fetch. Remember, the control store consists of all possible control signals for different states. Every state has an entry over here, and each entry is a micro-instruction. Microsequencer tells us for the next cycle, you should get this micro-instruction based on the state of the machine, based on all of these control signals. And you fetch it during this cycle, you fetch that micro-instruction during this cycle, and at the end of the cycle, you latch it into a micro-instruction register, and now your control signals are available for the next cycle. So while processing is going on in the data path, you do processing in this microprogram control structure to figure out what are your going, control signals going to be for the next cycle. Make sense? So, okay, we're gonna see all of these structures. So in this case, you have 64 possible states and 35 control signals in each microinstruction. That's why this is 35. And microsequencer, as you can see over here, and the address is six bits because you have two to the 66 entries, which means that the maximum number of states we're going to see is two to the 64, uh, sorry, two to the six, which is 64 over here. Uh, microsequencer, as you can see, uh, gets some signals from the current control signals, plus some stuff from the data path. So you may be familiar with some of these. This is instruction register, top, uh, top four bits, no, top five bits, sorry. Yeah, I can count stuff, it's five. <laughs> and this R is the ready bit we just discussed, whether the memory is ready or not. Because wh why is this important? Because the next state may be dependent on what are your, uh, what is, what is the uh, instruction in the instruction register? It may also be dependent on whether the memory is ready or not. It may also be dependent on these signals over here, which we're going to see. This signal specifies, IRD specifies whether you're in the decode state. If you're in the decode state, you should do something. Uh, there's a, a multi-way branch in the state machine, as we will see. This condition specifies whether you should take into account this orbit or not. Because you may be in a state that doesn't care about memory, right? You may be doing computation. Then you don't take into account the orbit in the decision you're making on which micro-instruction to fetch from the control stall in the next cycle. So all of these signals are designed and provided to the microsequencer such that it makes the correct decision as to which instruction to fetch, which micro-instruction to fetch for the next cycle. In other words, which state to transition into. Remember, transition to state and micro-instruction are synergistic. A state is determined by the micro-instruction and a micro-instruction specifies a state. Okay. So let's go into a little bit more detail. Hopefully the high level is clear. Is this beautiful? Yeah, so, so? Okay, sounds good, some of you like it. Yeah, it'll become more beautiful as you understand it. So basically the control signals for the current state control two things, processing in the data path, as I said, which MOXs should be enabled, what should be gated onto the bus, all of those things. What should the ALU be doing? It could be a, a, a of course some of these control signals can be don't cares, right? depending on the state. It also determines the generation of control signals, i.e. the micro-instruction for the next cycle. We'll have a supplemental figure uh, in the next next slide. I'll talk about this a little bit. Why, in, why for the next cycle? Right? We'll see that because of critical path design principle, you would like to generate your control signals for the next cycle in the current cycle. Okay, and data path and micro-sequencer operate concurrently. Uh, yeah. I guess I'll switch to this one very quickly. Uh, if I can figure out how to do this. This is DocuCam. There we go. 
We need to minimize this context switch overhead. Oh wow, what is this? Okay, there is a light. Wow, that's magic. <laughs> okay, that magic is good. This is all I wanted to show actually. Basically, you have this control structure. That's the micro, uh, control means micro sequencer and the control store, and this is the micro instruction. This is happening concurrently with what's happening in the data path. That was true for all of the other machines, but now we have a better structure, better separation between control and data path, right, as you can see. And there's also memory and I.O. as we will uh, discuss over here. Okay, let me go back to this PC now. So that concurrency of operations is important, which means that either of them can be your critical path, right? So the question, as, we, as we've discussed before, why should you not generate control signals for the current cycle in the current cycle? Because that violates the critical path design principle. I.e., it could length, lengthen the clock cycle. Let's take a look at uh, my pictorial thing over here, supplemental figures. Oh, okay, I, apparently I put it over here too. So this is basically, things operate concurrently and you should definitely do this reading. But here's my first supplemental figure. I'm very proud of this figure because it's very hand-drawn, right? <laughs> I could do it over here, but I think this, is a, this does a very good enough job that it's survived multiple years. <laughs> so basically, this is a clock cycle. If you look at a clock cycle, clock is high here and clock is low. At the end of the clock cycle, you latch the data, right? Basically, you latch the results of the processing in the data path, and you latch the control signals for the next clock cycle. That's the idea. It, that's, that's what happens at the end. Processing in the data path, uh, during the clock cycle, processing in the data path happens for this cycle, and generation of control signals for cycle M plus one. You don't generate the control signals for cycle N over here. And at the end, you latch the results of the processing, as well as control signals that are needed for the next cycle. That's a good design. That obeys the principle of critical path design, but this doesn't. So this is an alternative, this is a bad one. You see that it's a much longer clock cycle now over here. What, what this is doing is it's generating control signals for clock cycle N, and then doing processing in the data path for cycle N. This is a bad idea, because you do need those control signals immediately so that you can do processing in the data path, right? Maybe not immediately, depending on your paths in, in your logic, you may not need everything immediately, but you need some things immediately to be able to do the processing. Right? So if you actually decide to do your control signal generation for the same cycle, you need to do the processing. This is almost always a bad idea. You may be able to do it if you're really careful, but at some point when you change your clock cycle, for example, it may actually work against you because this may become your critical, critical path. This control signal generation may actually affect your critical path. Why? Essentially, step one is dependent on step zero. You need the control signals to be able to do the data path processing. If you remember uh, the pictures that we've shown earlier in the single cycle or multi-cycle microarchitecture, your ALU needs to know what to do, right? But if you figure out your ALU needs to know in the same clock cycle, you may actually take too much, too long of a time before your uh, data inputs to the ALU becomes ready, and now your control signals become your critical path. And there's really no reason to do that. You can generate your control signals much earlier. Most of your control signals. Remember, some of your control signals are not easy to generate beforehand because they're dependent on the processing of the data. Remember the branch equal condition or branch condition computation? That has to go through the ALU. And that generates a control signal saying, should this branch be taken or not taken? That has to happen after the data path processing. But most of the other control signals you could have generated much earlier. That's why this is a really bad idea. So you should always do things like this. Process, uh, generate your control signals in, the same, uh, in this clock cycle, and those control signals control the next clock cycle. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Okay, let's go back to over here. So what is happening in the, uh, what determines the next st state control signals? We've been talking about control quite a bit, and we need to understand what determines the next state control signals. Let's talk about this. So clearly what's happening in the current clock cycle is important. The instruction that's being executed is important. Whether the condition of a branch is met, whether the branch is taken or not taken, is important, if the instruction that's being processed is the branch. Whether the memory operation is completing in the current cycle, if one is in progress. So these are these signals over here, coming from the data path. Okay? So basically what's happening, uh, well, also the nine signals over here. What's happening in the current clock cycle? What's the current state? 
So these are the nine control signals coming from the control block. We'll, we'll see what these are for, actually. Uh, the instruction that's being executed, clearly, it's important. If you're in the state uh, that really cares about this, that you need to take this into account. Whether the branch condition is met is also important, and that's the BEM bit. And whether the memory operation is completing, that's the R bit coming from memory. That's why we have this structure over here. They all determine what should happen in the next cycle. And also, which state you're in determines what should happen in the next cycle, right? Clearly, if you're in one state versus the other, you're not going to take into account uh, all of the control signals equally. You're going to ignore some of, the, uh, some of these signals. If you're not in a state that's doing memory access, you're, you're just going to ignore this. That's what this condition bit is about, one of the condition bits is about. So we're going to see this more. OK, let's go, go to the state machine. Is this clear? We're going, going to go through an example. So uh, this is just to hopefully prime your minds. Uh, if you look at the state machine, well, it's a multi-cycle machine, right? So we need to have a state machine. And the behavior of the LC3B microarchitecture is completely determined by uh, the 35 control signals and the additional seven bits that go into the control logic from the data path. And we've already seen this. I wish I, I was able to switch between these two over here. Uh, but why is it seven? Uh, it's really, OK, I'll go back. So this is the 35 control signals, and these are the seven bits that are coming from the data path. This nine over here uh, is a subset of these 35, as we've discussed. So 35 control signals that we have completely describe what's happening in the current state, completely describe the state of the control structure. And we can completely describe the state of the entire LC3B machine is a finite, finite state machine, basically with nodes and arcs. And you already know what a finite state machine is, so I'm not going to go through it, this. But you have a, a node that's corresponding to each state, and you have arcs showing how things should flow. So basically, the appendix C over here has uh, one of the figures. This is the finite state machine. We're going to go through that in a little bit more. But each state must be uniquely specified, clearly, as with any finite state machine. And in this case, we have 31 distinct states encoded with six state variables. Why six? You could say that, oh, 31 distinct states, you could encode it in five state variables, right? Well, it's always good to have possibility to extend your finite state machine. And we will see one of the big powerful things about micro-coded machines is you could keep adding micro-instructions, and you could extend, add more states. For example, if you find that one instruction is buggy, and if you're able to update your micro-code, you could actually issue a hardware patch that replaces your microcode, this control structure. And now you've changed how your machine behaves. And this actually happens, I, I don't want to say often, but once in a while, if people find bugs in a processor that they can fix using these microcode updates. What they're doing is they're essentially changing the micro instructions. So these, this concept exists in almost all machines that we have today. And it's a very powerful concept to fix the processor also. That's why you don't want to have if you, if you really need 31 states to do the processing of your ISA, you don't want to have just 32 entries in your control store, because that gives you very little flexibility to change your micro instructions. Right. Add, if you want to add a new instruction, for example, you could do it with a microcode update, if you have enough control store entries. OK, we'll get back to this. This is really, really powerful. OK, uh, so examples. Oh, I, I guess I'll have to go through this now. So let me give you some examples. I'm going to lose myself if I don't do this over here. Let's be organized. OK, uh, DocuCam again. So this is our state machine for the LC3B uh, I, uh, microarchitecture and the ISA. Can you see this well? For some reason, it's not. If I do autofocus, it's not good. If I do focus, that's not good. OK. Maybe it's not that intelligent after all. Is this good? No, right? Why is it not good? Any idea? What if I zoom in or out? Better? Maybe zooming in is better, I don't know. At least, OK. <laughs> is this better? <laughs> Slightly, right? OK, I don't know why it doesn't focus. This always has this problem. OK, basically, this is the first state. This is essentially, there should be a reset button over here that takes you into this state. This is the fetch state for the LC3B microarchitecture. And this corresponds to the beginning of the instruction processing cycle. And as you can see over here, uh, we will go through the data path also in a little bit. 
But what's, what's, what we're doing is we're putting the program counter into the memory address register, and we're incrementing the program counter. You always increment the program counter. And this is LC3B, so instructions are of size two bytes each. That's why you increment the program counter by two. Okay? And then you unconditionally jump to the next state. The next state, memory, you're accessing memory, and eventually when the memory becomes ready, the data will appear in MDR, memory data register. And you wait in this state until the ready bit is set. If the ready bit is not set, you keep staying in the state. If the ready bit is set, you go into the next state. Make sense? Once the ready bit is set, now we have the data that we're reading from memory into the M in the MDR, memory data register. Now we can take that data and put it into the instruction register. Because that data is our instruction. Remember, we put the program counter into the memory address register. So what we've done is we read memory at the address pointed to by the program counter. We waited for the memory, and the memory returned the result back. After the memory returned the result back, we put the data into the instruction register. That's our instruction. Now we fetch the instruction. And then we unconditionally transition to the decode state. Decode state is designed interestingly over here, as you can see, but it's kind of obvious. Depending on the value of uh, the opcode, the top four bits of the instruction register, we jump to a different state. It's a multi-way branch, if you will. It's a micro branch in the micro instruction. You, 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 you select a different control store entry for each of these. So essentially, this state, uh, the fetch state, has a micro instruction associated with it, a location, and that's stored in entry 18 or 19. They're both the same entry. It's replicated. And you will see why it's replicated if you really study the state machine. Um, so there, there are control signals associated with it that are stored in the control store over here, in the control structure, at entry 18 and 19. If I have a better version of this, I'll do something with it. Uh, data path. Yeah, I think this is a better version. Basically, now we see the control store over here. At location eight, uh, 18 and 19, you have the micro instruction corresponding to this state over here. And then you transition to this state afterwards, unconditionally, and then you access the micro instruction that's stored at location 33. And location 33 houses the micro instruction that, uh, well, actually, uh, while you're doing, sorry, I, I missed that. See, I, even I made the mistake. While you're processing uh, this state, you access the micro instruction at location 33 over here. And at the end of the processing of this state, you latch the micro instruction at location 33 into the micro instruction register such that you have it available for the entire clock cycle where you're going to access memory in the state. Make sense? So each state has an associated micro instruction. You fetch the micro instruction of the state in the previous uh, cycle, and that gets flashed at the beginning of this state over here, at the beginning of the cycle. Okay? So we're going to go through a bunch of these micro instructions in a little bit, but let's uh, talk a little bit more about this. Basically, what I've described is this, essentially. Oh, sorry. The fetch phase it consists of moving from state 18 to 33 and 35. And it can take arbitrary number of cycles. This is one cycle, unconditional micro jump over here. And then you wait until the memory is ready. It could be 1,000 cycles. And once the memory is ready, there's one more cycle. And once you're done, you're, back, you're in the decode state. OK, let me switch to this. OK, that's better. Yeah, that's the fetch phase. If I can get my, where did it go? Is it up there? Okay. Yeah, that's the fetch phase. Okay, and that's the state machine. Uh, the decode phase is state 32. We've seen that also. And that's the state machine that I just showed you. And the state machine implements the LC3 BISA, which some, uh, some, you're familiar with the LC3 right now, but you should get familiar with LC3 B also. You don't need to know exact details, of course, but you know what it is, right? It, it looks very similar to any other ISA, if you will. Any other, it looks very similar to MIPS also, but it's much simpler. You can see that the opcode is four bits, and you can see that, oh, there's a destination register, source register one, and an operand specifier. Depending on uh, the bit value that you have over here, this could be an immediate, or it could be uh, a register. 
So it's, it's an instruction encoding, essentially. Somebody came up with it, and it was designed nicely, in a sense, because it's very simple, as you can see. It was actually designed for educational purposes, so it, it helps a lot to explain things with this ISA. But the fundamental principles of ISAs are relatively similar, uh, as we've discussed. So let's talk about some questions over here. So we've seen the state machine. Uh, we're going to see it more. Maybe there's a better picture of it also. Yes, this may be better, but it doesn't fit here. That's okay. So how many cycles does the fastest instruction take over here? Well, it's clear that we can go back to the state machine over here. Okay. And the fastest instruction, you remember, each state is one cycle, but you could loop in a state. Uh, the fastest instruction, you don't see the entire thing over here, but this is one of the fastest instructions, for example. You have one, two, three, four, five states. And this is not waiting for memory. So maybe it takes five cycles plus how long it takes to keep the, uh, get the memory to be ready. This is also another instruction that takes really quickly, right? One, two, three, four cycles plus memory cycles, right? So five cycles plus extra memory cycles. You can think of it that way also. But there are some instructions over here that take longer, as you can see. I don't want to zoom out right now, but this is the top part. For example, this is load word. Load is always problematic. Load word takes... This is the address computation, this is memory access, another one, and the memory becomes ready, and then you go back to state 18 again. Make sense? So this is a much longer uh, instruction in terms of cycles. In, fa in fact, it does two memory accesses, as you can see, one for the fetch and one for the memory access. We discussed yesterday that all instructions need to do at least one memory access to get the instruction itself. Okay, let me switch back here. If I forget switching, let me know. How many cycles does the slowest instruction take? Well, I, I already showed you load word, actually. That's one of the slowest instructions. I'm not sure if that's the slowest instruction, but I believe it is. Okay. Uh, how, how do, uh, why does a branch take as long as it takes in the FSM? Just to demonstrate a principle, actually. Let's go back over here. Uh, this branch over here is interesting. Okay. This is the branch instruction. After you decode it, you go to the branch, and you do branch condition computation. But in LC3B, it's interesting. If, you're, if you remember uh, the ISA lectures, this is a condition code-based ISA, right? Which means that the branch instruction doesn't do any computation. It just checks the condition codes. So what does that mean? To be able to understand what that means, you really need to look at the definition of the branch instruction, which we did in the ISA lecture. But if you really want to understand what it means, you have to look at this document that talks about what is uh, each, what does instruction do, right? So let's zoom out. Okay, that's the branch. Okay, I guess it's not terrible. Do you know how to focus this? Autofocus, I, pr I pressed it, and this is the best we can do. Okay, I guess it's not terrible. So I'll try to not move stuff. Basically, this is the definition. These are the NZP bits. Which, which of the condition codes the branch is testing? Somebody set the condition codes. You did an add operation. If the result was negative, the uh, N bit was set, and Z and P were, were set to zero. If the result was zero, Z bit was set. Others were set to zero. If the result was positive, P bit was set. The others were set to zero. Now, the branch is going to test this. Uh, what, it's, what's, what it essentially does is, some of these bits will be set. So if you can branch on negative, for example. In that case, this N bit will be set, Z and P will be zeros, and the branch will do this. If the N bit is set and the N condition bit is set, or if the Z bit is set and the Z condition bit is set, or if the P bit is set and the P condition bit is set, you take the branch. Otherwise, you don't take the branch. You don't, uh, otherwise, your program counter is the next program counter. Make sense? So basically, if any of the condition codes that the branch is testing is set, you take the branch. That's essentially what's happening over here, but that's not true. So if you look at this, that's a control signal that's affecting the next cycle. So the person who designed this ISA was quite principled. So what he did was actually did the branch computation earlier in the decode stage before knowing that the branch instruction is a branch. Why? Because you can. Why can you? You, can, you just take these bits from the instruction, 
that's available, you already fetched the instruction, you're in the decode state. You compare them to the condition codes, and the condition codes are part of the ISA, they're registers inside your data path. And you can do this computation completely before knowing that instruction's a branch, right? So you actually know whether the branch should be taken or not taken before you know that the instruction's a branch. And when you actually determine that the instruction's a branch, you can just change the program counter based on the value of that bit. So this is an example of early computation. You can think of this as relatively speculative computation also, because you're doing something before you know that you're really supposed to do it, right? Why is it ha happening here? Because it's a control signal that affects processing in the next cycle. Now, realistically, this processing is very, very simple, right? Very likely it's not going to affect your critical path at all. But this person was still principled, and they did it early such that it's, not go it's definitely not going to affect your clock cycle, whatever you do with this machine, okay? So that's the idea over here. So there are two multiple concepts over here. You generate a control signal, whether the branch is going to be taken or not taken. In the previous cycle, compared to when the signal is going to be used. That's the first principle, critical path design principle. The second principle is uh, you do things early, speculative execution. You don't know whether it's needed or not, but you did earlier just in case if it's needed in the future. Now, we have not talked about this as much, but this enables much faster processing. And in this case, it's helping the critical path. That's how it enables uh, uh, faster processing. So I spent a lot of time over here, but uh, you can actually see that if this computation was more complex, if the branch was doing something more, this could potentially become your critical path. Okay, let me finish a couple of things and then we'll take a break. This time it's a 10 minute break. You're, you guys are the lucky ones, you, you came here. <laughs> okay, so what determines the clock cycle time? Uh, clock cycle time essentially is determined by the critical path. We cannot decide that based on, uh, based on the state machine. That really depends on our design of uh, this thing, right? And this is our, uh, I mean, you cannot, of course, decide that just by looking at this. You need to do the critical path analysis. But your critical path is determined by, well, and in the break, I'll figure out how to operate this thing. And every time I operate it, I have to figure it out again. Okay, basically, you don't need to know, you don't need to see exactly how, what these things are, but uh, this is our data path that we're going to go through. Okay, I think this is a good place to take a 10 minute break. Let's be back at uh, 2.12, and then we'll continue with the data path. And we should really figure out what to do with this thing. We have, we have, we have a nice machine to cover. <laughs> and then you can have a nice weekend. Okay, uh, basically, we'll, we're talking about the data path. Uh, and this is the data path we're going to examine. I hope you can see it much better than before, but I think this is the best we're going to do for now. Is it good? Can you guys see it well? Okay. I don't know, maybe we should get this fixed. Juan, can you put something to someone so that we can, <laughs> we can get a better projector or something, or DocuCam, this is important. Basically, this data path is a single bus data path design, and before you said, some of you said, actually, is this a good design or bad design? Well, in this case, it's a frugal design. It doesn't have a lot of buses. It has this huge bus over here, right, that's going everywhere. It may or may not be good, right? But I think it's, it's, it's conceptually good over here. It, it demonstrates some concepts. But if you really want high frequency, maybe this, this may not be a good design, right? So if you could, if you, uh, the bus is essentially a transport between different elements of the data path. At any point in time, only one, one value can be gated on the bus. So you see this gate signals over here. Essentially, are you gating the value of the output of the ALU on the bus, right? Are you gating the output of the shifter on the bus? There are control signals over here, gate ALU, gate shift, and there's a gate MIR MUX, memory address register MUX, gate PC. Are you gating any of these elements on the bus? Uh, so the advantage of this is, a single bus can carry any of these values. You gate only one value on the bus, and you can transport it anywhere the bus goes, right? For example, in the first cycle, 
uh, we can gate the program counter onto the bus, setting this control signal. We'd better set all of the other control signals that control gating onto the bus. Uh, where is this? Gate ALU, gate shift, gate MAR marks all to zeros, and also gate MDR, all to zeros. Only one value should load the bus. If you put multiple values on the bus, what you get is an unidentified signal, a Z value, right? Because you're basically doing something you're not supposed to do. Two things cannot be driving the same wire. They can be, in the end, what you get is garbage. So if, if, you, if you want program counter to be, low, uh, to be put onto the bus, you gate the program counter and you don't gate anybody else. That means that this control signal should be set to one, everything else that's gating onto the bus should be set to zero. Now we're, re we're really doing microprogramming little by little. This is essentially our microprogramming, the micro instruction that you need in this state over here should gate program counter onto the bus and put it into the MAR and also increment the program counter. We need to program the machine such that it does exactly what we want to do in that particular state. Gate PC set to one, PC now gets put onto the bus and we want to put it into the MAR. Oh, MAR is here, looks nice. Which means that we can set the LDMAR signal such that whatever is gated onto the bus loads the MAR at the end of the clock cycle. So that's part of our micro instruction. Gate PC is one, gate MAR max, A gate ALU gate shift is zero, gate MDR is zero, LDMAR is one. Now we also need to increment the program counter. LDPC is one at the end of the clock cycle. We latch the next value of the PC and PC should get PC plus two according to our finite state machine, which means that this PC max should have the right values associated with it. I believe it should be set to Whatever, so how do you figure that out? That depends on your design, of course. And if you read Appendix C over here, that tells you exactly how you should set these signals. Because you should set them correctly, because whether or not it's a zero or one means something. So this is the PC max that we were dealing with. I hope you can see that. Otherwise, I'll zoom. Okay, I'm zooming. That's PC max. Basically, zero, zero means PC plus two. That's the convention over here. Zero, one, two, three. This is, four, uh, this is a four, three input max. So uh, your control sig signals are zero, zero, you get PC plus two selected. If your control signals are zero, one, you get bus selected. And bus selection means, basically, you can see that there's a value coming into this PC max from the bus. And there's a value coming into the PC max from this adder over here, which is this adder. So you set the control signals to zero, zero to ensure that PC plus two goes through this MUX and gets loaded into the PC. Make sense? Basically, we've microprogrammed state one uh, or state 18 and 19. Are we done yet? No, we're not done yet because we need to set all of the other signals correctly. Now, what does correctly mean? Correctly means do no harm, right? We saw that in the multi-cycle and single-cycle microarchitecture. We're not accessing memory. We're not writing to anything else. So all of those load register signals should be set to zero. For example, we're not loading the IR, that should be set to zero. Uh, we are not accessing memory, there should be a memory IO enabled signal somewhere over here. Well, we're not loading the MDR, so that should be set to zero. Uh, there's a memory IO enabled, there's memory enabled, oh, there you go, MIO enabled. That should be set to zero because we're not doing anything to memory. Uh, as a result, uh, we should not really do any harm. So, and a lot of the other control signals can be don't cares, right? For example, we're, not load, we're, we're, not de we're definitely not loading anything into this gate MAR MUX. So anything that affects uh, whatever goes into this gate MAR MUX uh, should not get, uh, uh, can, be, can be don't cares. So this could be a don't care, for example, right? Or this could be a don't care. Or ALU, what the ALU is doing is a don't care at this point, right? Because we're not using the ALU, okay? So that's how you do the microprogramming. And I'll show you what you microprogram. Well, this is our beautiful control store. Basically, we need to do the microprogramming in our control store. Can you see this thing? Oh, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> this is our 64 entry control store. And you're not able to read these over here, but these are essentially the control signals, 35 control signals. These are 64 different entries, and we're really concerned with state 18 and 19. Their control signals are exactly the same. And basically, we filled it out. 
we're going to fill it out again <laughs> with zeros and ones. Make sense? It's very simple. <laughs> now you will see that it's very simple. <laughs> okay, so nothing is magic over here. So let me go back over here. We'll talk a little bit more about the data path. Uh, and I want to uh, make a point over here. I was talking about this, but the advantage of having a single bus is low cost, right? The disadvantage is reduced concurrency. If an instruction needs the bus twice for two different things, they have to happen in different states, right? But that was also the beautiful advantage of a multi-cycle machine. You could get away with a single resource as long as you use it in different states, right? That's the beauty of this. So the disadvantage actually is an advantage of the machine itself, but Clearly, if you want higher concurrency, you should not limit yourself to a single bus like this. Okay, we already said this. Control signals determine what happens in the data path in one clock cycle. And yeah, that's our data path. So this is our data path. I'm not gonna go through the entire data path. We're gonna go through it just enough to fill some micro instructions, but you can read Appendix C and you can study on your own. You'll see a lot of actually really, really interesting things. When I first saw this data path, that was in 1998 actually, when I was taking the a very similar class to this uh, from, uh, from, the, from one of the co-authors of the book, the blue book, Yale Pat. Uh, and I was really amazed with this machine. And I really used the concepts that I learned in that class everywhere almost. So I would really strongly recommend that you understand how this thing works and how things are designed because it's very clean and simple. It doesn't have all the complexities that you have in a real machine today, but all you need is really the fundamentals. Like, for example, how do you do a memory mapped I.O.? We're not gonna have much time to talk about that, but if you read that chapter over there, you'll learn a lot, no question about that. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the components over here. Okay, uh, so there are other data path components that do not fit here, and you will see that in the Appendix C, and these may look familiar to you. So for example, this is the destination register ID. Should it come from the three bits of the instruction, nine through 11, or should it be register seven? This looks kind of similar to what we had in MIPS. Another one that looks kind of similar to what we had in MIPS. Should your source register one ID come from bits nine through 11 of the instruction or bits six through eight of the instruction? Well, again, we had something similar in MIPS, right? MIPS data path. Going into the register file, you had these muxes that determine which bits of the instruction should, you, should be used to ID, uh, should, to, to be provided as the address of the register file, that, uh, the address that you're going to read. And this happens because instruction encodings are reasonably similar across architectures. And this one is another one over here. This is exactly what, we, what we've seen with the branch taken bit. Is the branch taken or not? It's called branch enable in this microarchitecture, but is the branch taken or not? Basically it takes IR 11 through nine, which is the NZP bits if the instruction is a branch, and it compares them to the NZP bits from the condition codes that are part of the architecture. Those are registers and it determines whether or not the branch is taken. Just like we've discussed earlier. I'm not gonna go through that again. Okay, so there's no magic in any of this. It's actually very, very beautiful. Okay, uh, I've shown you this also basically, these are the 35 control signals that we have. And in order to microprogram a machine, for every state, you need to set these control signals correctly. And we're going to do that for some states. But before we do that, let's talk about some questions. And we actually did part of it uh, just now. How does instruction fetch happen in this data path according to the state machine? I think we've gone through this. What is the difference between gating and loading? I think this is important. Well, how does instruction fetch happen? We've gone through this because I've shown you uh, this thing over here. All right. Basically, this is how it happens. And we're going to go through this in detail, so I'm going to go through and uh, fill the microcode. Uh, in the control store for that. So let's not spend time on that. But let's spend time on this gating versus loading. You know this concept by now, but I want to reinforce it uh, a little bit. So gating essentially is uh, uh, enabling you to put a value onto a wire, right? That's what's called gating. And you saw this thing before, right? That's a tri-state buffer. If you remember the tri-state buffer, if the control input is enabled, what the tri-state buffer it, it does is it passes the input to the outputs, right? If the control input is disabled, the output becomes Z, floating value. It doesn't drive, basically. As, essentially, it disconnects this bus from whatever is over here, right? That's the function of a tri-state buffer. That's how we, 
we can implement it. So that's the idea of gating. On the other hand, loading is something completely different. Uh, it's essentially a write-enable signal to a register. That's why these are called load IR signals and gate PC signals. And whenever you're designing a machine or anything, actually, if you're doing software programming, it's always good to be very, very principled about how you name your signals. So these are all uh, the, the signals that control writing into the registers are all, always called load over here. The signals that control driving a bus are always called gate over here. And this is another fundamental principle that's not really an architectural principle, but it's really a design principle, if you will. Always name your things, uh, name your variables consistently. Okay, let me switch over here. So a gating, as I said, it enables or disables an input to be connected on the bus or a wire. And the way you do it is by using a tri-state buffer here. There are other structures that you can use, low level, like pass transistors. If you're actually reading your book, you'll see some of those structures, but I didn't go over them in lecture. And this is combinational. This happens during a clock cycle. Whereas loading, as I said, it enables, disables writing into a register, and this happens at the end of the clock cycle in our assumptions. It's sequential, essentially. The signal itself is not sequential, but it's controlling sequential logic. Okay, so is this the smallest hardware you can design? I'm not going to switch back to this, but is this the smallest hardware you can design? You can ask that question to yourself. I'm not sure, frankly. I don't think it is, but it's relatively, relatively good in terms of how small it is. I don't think it's small enough because, for example, okay, I'll switch, sorry. Uh, it's, it's not smallest because this ALU is not used for program counter plus two computation, right? So that answer is already given. But usually, it's, it's a lot of wiring. Uh, so there are multiple reasons why you don't use the ALU for PC plus two computation. First of all, this is a specialized logic, right? You could actually do PC plus two all the time. You could specialize that adder. Second, your wires need to be connected a lot across all of your parts of your machine. So when you're really designing it, you should take, this, take these into account. But this is not the minimal hardware for various reasons that I just said. Okay. Okay, microprogram control structure. We have the micro, micro instruction control store and micro sequencer. I'll switch back. I've covered a lot of these, so we should jump into microprogramming before it becomes too late. Okay, I've already said this basically. Micro instruction is stored in a unique location in the control store. What is the control store? This is our control store. It's empty now. But one of your optional homework assignments is filling this out. <laughs> and everybody who fills it out is happy in the end. <laughs> And you get, the, you get the idea very quickly, so you don't fill, fill out everything. So you figure out how to do it really quickly also. So unique location, it's the address of the state corresponding to the micro instruction. Okay, we already said this. So this is the control store. And it's a very simple design of the control structure. It's not a complicated design. It's very, uh, it's very compartmentalized, if you will. Different functionalities are separated from each other. Okay, so, so this is the micro sequencer. I, I'd like to talk about this a little bit. Basically, this, basically, this determines the next address, address of the next state, address of the next micro instruction. And in this case, it's a two input mux. This one gives you zero, zero, and the last uh, top four bits of the instruction register, which is the opcode. And if IRD is set to one, the next address of the next state is this, basically. If IRD is set to zero, the address of the next state is determined based on this J bits. J bits are part of your control structure. And some other stuff, whether the branch is taken or not, and if you're testing a branch, whether the memory is ready or not, and if you're testing whether memory is ready. And there's something else over here. This is the jump uh, related thing, which I'm not gonna talk about over here, but you can take a look. Uh, but basically, these are conditional changes in the microcontrol store. Your, this, the address of your next state is determined conditionally based on what's happening in the data path, whether the memory is ready, whether the branch is taken. So for example, your J bits are set to some values over here. Uh, if the memory is not ready, and if you're testing memory, if you're testing memory, you'd better set the condition bits over here, condition zero to one, and condition one to zero, such that this AND bit, AND gates output depends on the R value over here, right? And this is uh, put very nicely, uh, because only one bit changes. If, if the R bit is set, and if you're testing the R bit, this bit becomes one. So otherwise, your J bit should be zero, meaning that you should do the state encoding such that if the memory is not ready, you should stay in the state, and this bit should be zero for that state. 
And if the memory becomes ready, you jump into the state where the state address differs by only one compared to the state you read. Make sense? So this is simple logic design. You can actually design a different microsequencer. This is designed to be nice and relatively minimal. You could design a much, more comp uh, much less minimal uh, microsequencer also. So this actually minimizes the number of, a number of locations in your control store, if you will. OK, uh, let me go into this. OK, we already said this. OK, let me go to this question. When is the IRD signal asserted? To be able to see when is the IRD signal asserted, I want the microsequencer as well as this thing over here. So this is our microsequencer. Still looks nice. That's the address of the next state at the bottom. And you can easily see that when is the IRC, IRD signal asserted, right? In this state, you should assert the IRD signal such that the next state address should be one of these 16 things, right? No, it's nice. That's one of these 16 things. Depending on the value of the uh, opcode, you choose the address of the next state. And this design is nice such that uh, the, uh, the address of the next state, for example, the address over here is 1, the address over here is 5, the address over here is 9, and that's directly dependent on the opcode encoding. Okay? Now you can understand this by studying the ISA, but it's, it's relatively trivial to understand, so I'm not going to go through it that detail. Okay, there's another question. What happens if any illegal instruction is decoded? Somebody wrote an instruction that you cannot execute. Well, that's what, uh, well, what are those instructions, first of all? What could be those instructions? Uh, if you look at the LC3B ISA over here, uh, I want to have this, yes, there you go. So there are some instructions that are not used, right? But somebody can actually put that instruction in your binary. What if that happens? Well, it's nice. You can actually still jump into the state, and that state may actually do something, generate an exception, right? We're, talk, we're going to talk about exceptions later. But this is not filled out in the state machine, but you can easily fill out some other state over here saying, oh, okay, you did something wrong. I executed an illegal instruction, so I'm going to stop the machine, right? You could keep adding states to this. Okay. What are the condition bits are for? I've already said that these condition bits determine which, uh, they, they affect the addresses over here depending on which condition you're testing in a given state. For example, as we will see later on, in this state, we're going to test the R condition, right? So we should, we'd better test, we'd better set these condition bits such that the next state address is dependent on this R bit. If we set these to 0, 0, the next state address is not dependent on any of these, right? Because these will all be zeros. But if we set this to 1, 0, the next state address is dependent on R. Okay. How is variable latency memory handled? We've already discussed that. How do you do the state encoding? I think you can enjoy that on your own. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, switch. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> See, that's, that's exactly uh, why I need you guys to shout. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, basically, uh, we've already discussed the variable latency memory. How do you do the state encoding? That's actually, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, theory that goes uh, behind it. So you can do the minimization of this, but I'm not going to go into the detail. Uh, but you need to actually do logic design minimization over here, some of which we've discussed, some of which you need to uh, learn on your own, but I'm not going to make you responsible for the state encoding. It's boring. <laughs> Okay, let's do an exercise in microprogramming which is much more interesting and fundamentally much more uh, useful. So what we're going to do is, we're going to, this is actually already on the website. Uh, there are some LC3B figures, seven of those. Now I've created a mess over here, but redundancy always helps. These are the seven ones. Uh, and you can download them and you can do this on your own. Basically, we're going to look at the control and data path, this figure, uh, the state machine, this figure, uh, the data path, and a simple data path can become very powerful, as we will see later. But we're going to fill out some of the states over here. Okay. I hope I have that. I thought Juan gave me that. Maybe I picked the wrong one. Okay, I see it. 
Weird. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, this is a good one. This is what we're going to do. Fill in the seven micro instructions. I'm not sure if we're going to have the patience to do seven or the time to do the seven, uh, but that's going to be the fun part now. Oh, it's exactly the same as this. Wow. <laughs> okay. So this is what we're going to do, basically. We need the data path also. Unfortunately, I cannot put the data path into a single slide over here, but I'm going to get that now. Mm. Basically, uh, this is part of the control store that uh, concerns us with the load word instruction. At least I'm going to do four of these over here. The rest I may leave it to you. Uh, and basically, this is a subset of the state machine. So if you look at a load word instruction, we need to fetch it, we need to decode it, we figure out that it's a load word, and then we go through this. Basically, this is the slice of the state machine that does the load word. I replicated over here, and we're going to go through the microprogramming of it. We've actually done part of that, so it's going to be relatively easy. So let's look at the first state. Uh, PC should go to MAR, and PC plus two should go to PC. That's the idea. And we've already seen this. How do you get PC to MAR? Uh, you basically gate PC and ungate everything else. Gate PC should be one. Everything else that's, that has a gate in front of it should be zero. This should be one, zero, 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 zero. Good. We got five out of 35. OK. <laughs> and now PC is loaded over here. MAR should get it, so we should load the MAR. So load MAR should be one. OK. And the, the other thing we do over here is PC gets PC plus two. So PC plus two should flow through a PC mux and load the PC. So we remember that PC mux should select this input that coming from PC plus two. And remember that it was zero, zero to be able to do that. Now, the way you really determine it is by looking at this thing and doing the encoding. So the encoding is such that this is zero, this is one, or this is zero, 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 one, one, zero. OK. OK, so we got that right. But we also need to load the PC, so we do this. And everything else, do no harm. Do no harm. We're not loading MDR. We're not loading anything over here. Dot, dot, dot. OK. And everything else over here, uh, still do no harm. We're not enabling memory I.O. Read write signal over here. That's interesting, because I don't remember. So you need to decide whether you're reading or writing. I believe this could be a don't care if you're not enabling memory or I.O., but I'm not absolutely sure at the moment. Uh, that's why you need to study the data path. Data path. Uh, yeah, I think if memory is not enabled, these signals uh, do not take effect. But that depends on the specification of memory. So in this case, to be safe, you can actually do zero, right? Because we're not reading from memory, but I believe this should really be an X. Data size is also an X, and left shift is also an X. These are part of the data path components that really don't matter for this instruction. So I think data size is what is the size of the data you're reading or writing into memory, and this left shift mux is whether you're doing the left shift. Clearly, we're not doing, we're not really, really taking the output of these anywhere, so these can be don't care as easily. Similarly, we're not doing anything in the ALU. We discussed this. We're not doing anything with the MAR mux because we're not loading uh, it onto the bus. Uh, we're not doing anything in this address mux. We're not doing anything here. SR mux, DR mux, they're all X's because they're, uh, the outputs that they generate are not going to be used to latch anything into a register. So these are the DR mux, SR1 mux signals because we're not going to read from the register file. Uh, at least we're not going to latch the data that comes out of the register file anywhere because we dis uh, or load it in, uh, anywhere onto the bus because these gating signals are all already set to the zero and register file is connected, as you can see, to the ALU and it's gated off, if you will. That's why these can all be access. Now we've actually set the 26 signals very easily, right? We microprogrammed the data path. Now we're not done yet because we need to also microprogram the signals that uh, are going to be used by the microsequencer exclusively. And that's essentially these signals. Uh, so IRD signal, if you look at the microsequencer, we're not in the decode state, so this IRD signal should be zero. Oh, I made a mess over here. Okay. <laughs> so don't, uh, that, that, that's, that's another common mistake. You know, when you're doing programming, you should put the information in the right line. <laughs> 
but now I can fix it dynamically, as you can see. Uh, by the way, these kind of fixes are actually similar to what may happen in microcode updates. <laughs> People may put something in the wrong line. This, now, this is a very obvious thing that could, found, that could be found with uh, testing techniques today. But sometimes people make mistake in one of the signals. Uh, and if that signal is not caught, you can fix it by sometimes jumping to a different state if you have that sort of programmability, or just microcode update and fixing that signal. That's why this is a very beautiful concept. We'll talk more about that. OK, uh, so we're not in the decode state. We should get the next state from here. And if you look at the state machine, oh, there's a state machine. That's good. Uh, the next state is unconditional, and we should jump to 33. How do we enable that? Now, next state does not depend on IR. We fix that. This is 0. Next state is unconditional, so none of this should matter. So I'm going to set condition bits to 0, 0. That's unconditional. And if you really want to double check, you will see that, oh, there you go. Yeah, next state is unconditional. That's 0, 0. OK? And our next state should always be 33. So our J bits should be 33, right? They're not dependent here. So everything, the next state will be dependent purely on these J bits. These J bits specify what should the, next, what should the address of the next state be if you're going there unconditionally. Am I correct? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. There you go. That's 33. So that's your micro instruction for this state. We're done. Let's go to the next state. <laughs> now you can do this for 31 states, but we're going to do it for a, a few. So the next state is memory, uh, uh, gets, uh, memory provides the result into MDR. Remember, in the previous state, we had MAR loaded. In the next state, we're going to access memory now. Now we're going to do some dirty things with the memory. Uh, so how do we access memory? First of all, we're going to write into MDR. Memory writes into MDR. So let's take a look at the data path over there. This is a little bit uh, dirty, if you will. So this is the path we're going to follow. You see that, right? Yeah, this is the path we need to enable in the data path. And you can ignore the other stuff, which means that we need to enable memory I.O. OK? Uh, we're not writing to memory, so let's do that first. Memory I.O. is enabled. We're not writing to memory. We're reading from memory, so this better be 0. Uh, and if you really want to double check, you should really always look at the signals. Memory I.O. enabled. No is 0. Yes is 1, so that we did the right thing. Read, write. Read is 0. Write is 1, so we did the right thing. Uh, OK. Data size. Uh, data size. We're reading a word, which is an instruction, 16 bits. So it should be 1. OK, that's still part of memory. And now we've actually enabled memory to read from it 16 bits a word. I think that's enough on this part, but we're not fully done yet because we want to put the data into the MDR as specified by our state machine. Right? So we need to load MDR. OK, I think that's it. Well, the rest is do no harm. We're not loading MAR. Actually, loading MAR would be very bad because you have the address in the MAR, right? You should not change the address while you're reading from memory. We're not loading IR. We're not loading any of these. Not loading the PC. And in this case, OK, what should the values of these gates enable signals be? Well, it doesn't do any harm to make them X's, right? <laughs> so if you actually make them X's, you can gate stuff onto the bus, but you're not actually taking the value on the bus anyway. Right? So technically, x's are OK. Now, electrically, maybe that's not a good idea, right? Ideally, you should not really load stuff on the bus unless you really need it. So technically, uh, from uh, theoretically, they're x's, because you're not using the values. But practically, why load stuff onto the bus that you're not going to deliver anywhere? There are multiple reasons for this. First of all, your bus is now electrically loaded. You may have reliability issues. You may have energy efficiency issues. So don't do that. So I would, I would argue that these should be set to zeros. But if you actually put it as x's, theoretically, they're correct, right? OK, PC marks, hopefully it's very clear that these can be x's over here. OK, and left shift is also x over here. Make sense? So the reason these can be x's and I don't like these being x's is these may do harm. <laughs> OK? 
Whereas these really don't do harm. They're really logic elements that are going to execute anyway, right? So that's a, there, there's another question over here, actually. If you really want to minimize energy, you may actually want to do a different encoding in your micro instructions, right? Remember, we were in this state over here. We're going to this state. If you want to minimize energy, you want to minimize the switching of the wires. A wire should not switch between 0 to 1, 1 to 0, 0 to 1, 1 to 0, over and over, because that actually causes a lot of energy. Remember the energy equation, maybe one of the first few lectures. We said the dynamic energy consumed is uh, proportional to the capacitance, uh, voltage, uh, square, and frequency. But there's also an activity factor in front of it. If you're not switching at all, you're not consuming dynamic energy. So you need to be able, you need to be switching. So if you really want to encode these states such that you minimize energy, what you would do is you minimize switching. Remember, we're moving from state 18 to state 33. I should fix that. Uh, these are all x's, but why not make them all zeros? That way you don't switch. Right. In fact, there's another energy optimization you can do. Some of the circuits are less, more energy efficient if they're staying at zeros. Some of the circuits are more energy efficient if they're staying at once. You may want to figure out what is more energy efficient with what value and supply that value all the time without changing it. So now you can see the richness of the design, right? Depending on your optimization, you can do these tricks. But theoretically, these can be X's. And theoretically, even these gate signals will be X's. But I wouldn't do it. <laughs> OK, uh, so let's look at this control structure now. Uh, now we're done with the data path. Uh, and the control structure is going to be more interesting now. Clearly, we're not decoding the instruction. So that should be 0. We are conditional. Our state is. If the ready bit is set, next state is 35. If the ready bit is not set, the next state is 33. And somebody was clever enough to have a difference of only two, which means one bit, when they, designed, when they encoded these states. So meaning, unconditionally, we should go to state 33. So our J bits should still be state 33. But we're dependent on the condition, and the condition is if the ready bit is set. If z condition 0 bit is, should be 1, condition 1 bit should be 0. Condition 1 bit should be 0, 1. Now let's do, go back and verify this. Memory ready. Yes, 0, 1. Right? Now p uh, somebody was smart enough to design the microsequencer such that these two states are separated from each other by only 1 bit. And that 1 bit is dictated by the ready bit over here. Makes sense, right? OK, so we're done now. Basically, we'll stay in the state until the memory becomes ready. When the memory becomes ready, we put MDR into IR. Let's do that very quickly again. Uh, it's relatively simple. Mm. So what do we do? When, when the memory becomes ready, we have the data in the MDR. We just need to put it, gate it onto the bus, and put it into IR. Actually, this is a very simple path again. So we'd better gate MDR. Uh, gate MDR is over here. That's a 1. Uh, and we'd better gate nothing else, I think. That's, that's the only thing we're doing over here. And we better load IR. Load IR. Everything else is do no harm, right? And we're going to do, we, this time, this, these will definitely have to be zeros because we want to gate only one thing on the gate MDR. So even theoretically, these have to be zeros. Again, PC mux, the R mux, this R mux dot dot dot, they're all X's, right? Memory IO enabled, it's not enabled. And read write, uh, we're not reading, uh, but I think this could be an X. And data size, in this case, data size matters. Data size matters. Uh, data size is because we're, we're actually moving the data over here. So you should re read the uh, appendix, which talks about what this logic does. This essentially does alignment, which I'm not going to talk about a lot. But there's one slide over there. And I'm not going to keep you responsible for it. It's another concept that's interesting. Uh, but basically, the data size should be a word, because we're moving a word, right? And left shift should be x. Now we're done again. This is state 35. And our next state is unconditionally state 32. Now you've figured it out. We're not in the state. We're not doing anything conditional. And 32 is this. Right? Sounds good. OK, I'll do one more, and then you'll do the rest for your optional homework. <laughs> It's optional, so you don't have to do the rest, right? So the one more is actually really easy. This is this, state 32. Uh, state 32, what are we doing in the state 32? 
actually nothing really interesting in the data path. We're loading the branch enable, and we discussed why we're doing that earlier because of the principle. So branch enable should be loaded, and that's over here. Yeah, that's this logic over here, basically. Branch enable, register, and to be perfectly correct, there should be a LDBN signal here, right? Okay, and we should not be changing anything else according to our state machine. We should not be loading anything onto, uh, gating anything onto the bus. And these things are don't cares until we get to memory. Memory is not enabled. We're in, if it's not enabled, we're not doing anything to it. Data size, we don't care. This, we don't care. Okay? I hope I did it right, but LDBN is actually uh, somewhere over here, which is not shown over here. It wasn't that, but, but okay, let's go back over here. What do we do in the state? The next state is a multi-way branch now. It's not shown very well over here. Uh, if I find this thing, I'll show you better. Yeah, but this is, the multi this is a state where we're doing a multi-way branch. Well, that multi-way branch, the address of the next state is determined by this. So our IRD should be one. And if IRD is one, we're selecting this input to the max, so we don't care what's happening here. So these are really don't cares, right? Okay, so we're done with the four states. Now you can enjoy the rest <laughs> for yourself. Let's move back and talk about some other principles. This is clear? Is it, was this fun? You can see how fun it is, right? Yeah, you'll enjoy it. But existing, this is actually, this is very much similar to existing machines. Existing machines are much more complicated than this, but they all have control stores. And we'll see what else does it enable. Okay, simple design of the control structure, I'm gonna skip this. So that's our end of exercise in microprogramming. We talked about variable latency memory. I demonstrated that concept. The slide is for you to study. Could we have done this in a single cycle microarchitecture? No, unfortunately not. Uh, in the single cycle microarchitecture, we assume that memory and registers are a combinational logic, essentially, right? We didn't have the sequential behavior coming from them. Uh, they were able to be accessed in one cycle. Okay, I'm going to skip some of these things. We're going to talk about uh, exceptions. But you can actually implement a complex instruction using this control structure. Uh, for example, the repeat move S instruction that I discussed in the last, uh, design, uh, last uh, lecture. Actually, this is implemented very similarly in the x86 machines that you have today using micro instructions. Because it's a string copy of n elements starting from address A to B. Uh, and you can actually microprogram the machine to implement such an instru instruction. So this is basically it brings me to the power of abstraction. What I mean by that? We have this control store, uh, which we program part of it. Now we have a new abstraction for the hardware designer. It's microprogramming. The designer can translate any desired operation to a sequence of micro instructions, right? All the designer needs to provide is three things. One is the sequence of micro instructions that are needed to execute, implement the desired operation. The ability for the control logic to correctly sequence through those micro instructions. So you may need to change the control logic or you may need to add enough programmability into the control logic. And any additional data path elements and control signals that are needed. So of course, there is no need if the operation can be translated into existing control signals. So we can actually have control signals that you can control and do new operations on them. For example, you could do a multiplication as a series of additions and shift operations. You could actually do that in LC3B. A multiplication instruction doesn't exist, but if you have this control flow structure and if you actually are able to sequence through it by making very small changes, you could implement a multiplication as a sequence of shifts and adds. Right. That's beautiful now. Right. That's how we can add new instructions without adding a lot of logic into your machine also. Now, they may not be executing very fast because if you had a specialized multiplier, that would be much faster probably, but you can do it. Okay, now you can fix things also. Right. So I'll give you another uh, potential homework assignment, but you could actually implement repeat move S in the LC3B microarchitecture. And the key questions are, what changes do you need to do, if any, to all of these structures? Okay, that's optional homework. And you will figure out what a, a repeat move S is. It's fun. 
Okay, I'm going to skip the alignment correction. You can read it on your own. You're not going to be responsible for it, but it's something interesting to know. All modern ISAs have unaligned accesses. Basically, if an access starts at a boundary that's not aligned, the machine needs to deal with it. Okay, the, the, your, the thing over here, the, the Appendix C talks about it. But I'm going to talk about memory mapped I.O. a little bit. Uh, this is one way of doing I.O. operations. So some of the I.O. devices, let's say a keyboard or uh, a monitor, if you actually want to output something into the monitor, you can write to a region of memory that's designated for the monitor. You can write to a location that, it, that, that appears on the monitor. Right? That's the idea. You could uh, do input-output using load and store instructions to the I.O. devices. And in this case, again, I won't go into the details of this over here, but if you go through the data path, all of this logic over here uh, in the data path, okay, turn the light on, that becomes bigger. There you go, wow. All of this logic over here, this is the keyboard data register, keyboards, status register, monitor, output, and input status, uh, data and status. And some of the addresses are mapped here. So if the address is, for example, between, uh, this is, let's assume that this is your memory, if the address is some of these, the, func the job of this logic is to say, oh, this address is actually a keyboard or monitor, so let me read from it or write to it. Right. That's the idea. That's the notion of memory map I.O. This is used in many systems today. Okay, but you can read more about it on your own again. So there are a lot of concepts over here, which I'm not going to keep you responsible for, but you can understand them. They're very, very relatively simple. But let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this, and then we're going to conclude. But there are three major advantages of this microprogram architecture, as you can see over there. First of all, it allows a simple design to do powerful computation by controlling the data path using a sequencer. You can have a high-level ISA that's translated into microcode, sequence of microinstructions. And microcode enables a minimal data path to emulate an ISA. And microinstructions can be thought of as a user invisible ISA, or micro ISA. It's essentially an ISA, right? It's, a, it's another interface to the hardware. And the control store stores that, uh, stores what you want to do through that interface. It enables easy extensibility of the ISA as we discussed. You can support new instruction by changing the microcodes. You may need to change other things also. And you can support complex instructions as a sequence of simple micro-instructions. For example, repeat move S, pretty complex. It's a string move, string copy. Or increment a memory location. You may not have an instruction that says increment a memory location directly, but you could do that by loading the location, adding one to it, and then putting back the result into memory through a sequence of micro-instructions. Right? Okay. Enables update of machine behavior, and this is very, very interesting, especially today. A buggy implementation, or an implementation that's not perfectly secure, one, uh, one instruction maybe leaks some information, potentially you can fix that by changing the microcode in the field. Right? If you have the flexibility to do so. Uh, this is, of course, easier if the data path provides the ability to do the same thing in different ways. So, for example, if, uh, let, let, let me talk about the reliability perspective. For example, if you, you figure out your adder is not working very well or your PC program counter is not working very well. Uh, uh, pr uh, well, that's, pr that's a pretty bad bug, but let's bear with me. Your, not your program counter, the program counter plus two logic. The adder over there is not working very well. You could reprogram your microcode such that you go through some other adder in the data path, assuming you have those paths, right? That's the beauty of this. You can actually have redundancy in the design of your data path, and you can reprogram your machine such that if a part of your machine fails for whatever reason, or if you think it's not secure, you do things in a different way. Okay, so this is important because the, update, uh, the ability to update patch microcode in the field enables many things. After processor is shipped, uh, you can add new instructions. With, we, we said this without changing the processor. Of course, you may be limited in what you can enable, but you can enable it. You can fix buggy hardware implementations. Uh, I'll give you a couple of historical examples. This is, already, uh, this is still being done today, but this is a really old concept. IBM 370 Model 145. This is essentially the first machine that implemented a virtual machine. So I IBM was really uh, prominent in implementing virtual machines at the time. But you could store the microcode in main memory and can, be upda can update it after a reboot. IBM System Z today, these, these processors are actually modern versions of this. These are very powerful processors used in banking, for example. You could do the same thing. And if you're really interested, you can read this 
paper that talks about millicode. They call this millicode. Now give me one minute and then we'll uh, finish over here. There were machines where you could actually change the microcode while the processor is running. This is amazing, right? And actually use, you can do this at the user level. This is a user microprogrammable machine. Now this begs the question, where is your ISA, right? Now your ISA goes down to the micro, microcode level. A user is exposed to the microcode and they can change it. Okay, so we've covered a lot of stuff. I'll let you figure out the uh, advanced and disadvantages. We've covered a lot of the advanced and disadvantages also. But I think now the next question is, can we do better? And I'll leave you with this. We'll cover this in the next lecture and the lectures after that. Thank you and have a nice weekend.